I knew there had to be something. And when I found that out, then the conflict just crystallized, you know, mm -hmm. in my head. This is going to be this young woman and she is going to be making love matches. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where our guest today is Linda cohen Loyman, and we are going to be talking about her latest book, The Matchmaker's Gift. Now, a couple of years ago, I read her book, The Two Family House, and loved it. I absolutely love this book, and I was so happy to fall upon reading Matchmaker's Gift because I was like, oh, this is going to be another one where I'm just going to dive in and have a wonderful story surround me. It's also my latest book reporter bets on selection for 2022. Now, let me read what a reviewer had to say about it. Although the book is no fantasy, it crackles with real powerful magic that is matched perfectly by Lloydman's perfect, beautifully crafted characters whose battles with feminism, religion, ambition, and power round this gorgeous, uplifting novel and give it some weighty emotional heft. So with those words, I introduce Linda. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for having me in that review. That was such a beautiful review. So thank you so much for that. It just made me so happy to hear. I think she really hit every note that's going on in the book. And we'll make sure we link to it down in the notes down below, because it, I think she really hit um, it, everything you were trying to say. So let's start out by you telling us about the book. Sure. Um, so The Matchmaker's Gift is a dual timeline story. And it follows Sarah Glickman, who is um, a matchmaker. She's an immigrant. She comes over from the old country to New York City in 1910. And she realizes she has this gift for seeing other people's soulmates. Um, and then it's also about her granddaughter, Abby, who has her, you know, the bulk of her story in 1994. And she has very inconveniently inherited this gift because she's a divorce attorney. So that makes her life very messy to have this <laughs> gift that she doesn't want. You know, she's very cynical. She's your typical, you know, divorce attorney person, doesn't believe in love, doesn't believe in marriage, loved her grandmother very much, um, but she does not want to have this gift that she, you know, that she's just finds herself stuck with. Yeah. And we're going to get into the fact she's a divorce attorney. <laughs> so, <laughs> the book had a really interesting starting point. Mm -hmm. And tell us about that, because I think the story of how the story came about is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I wrote this book during COVID as so many, you know, so many of the books that are coming out now, that's what people are saying. But so in March of 2020, my daughter was a junior in college. And on a Tuesday, I got a call, you know, a she was crying. I, they're making us leave. We're getting kicked out of the dorms. We have to be gone by Sunday. And she came home and her roommate came home with her. And, you know, I mean, they missed out almost like half a year of college. So it was very nice of them to be together and pretend like they were still roommates or still in college. I mean, we have a guest room, so it worked out really nicely. Um, and it was a, like a real blessing to have my daughter's roommate. But so before then, I was living in a house of men. It was me, my husband, and my teenage son, and my dog, who's a boy. <laughs> and like, you know, we ate dinner together at night and we talked, but like, it was a house of men with, you know, with the talk around the dinner table wasn't so interesting. And then these two young women come home and they're both really bright and they're both really ambitious. And they're in the mid, they're like taking their classes. Like, so they're going to class and then coming to dinner. So they're really like, thinking and the dinner table conversation gets elevated like in a big way and we're talking about women's issues and we're talking about the things they're facing as students in college as women they're asking me about some of my work experiences because i used to be a lawyer and i'm realizing you know like it's not so different you know than it was like it hasn't really changed so much they're worried about the same things that i was worried about and that was kind of in my head so we're eating dinners because that's what we did. And then we're also binge watching television because that's the other thing everybody did. And our binge watch for a while was Indian matchmaking, which was so fantastic, so fun, like exploring that whole idea of matchmaking from a very different culture than my own. And at the end of watching all the episodes, my daughter's roommate, whose name is Adele, turns to me and says, you know, my grandmother was an Orthodox Jewish matchmaker in Brooklyn. And I say, really? And she pulls up on her phone this picture it's a New York Times. Her grandmother is in a New York Times article in like 19 in the 1970s. And it's this picture of her grandmother. And the article talks about her grandmother, just matchmakers in Brooklyn generally. And it took like references somebody's file cabinets, mm -hmm. like 
So I immediately, you know, we're book people, right, Carol? So like, if I say file cabinet to you, you think, I mean, I think you think the way I think. So I think like the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. And I immediately thought like, that would be such a fun matchmaking story, right? Like a grandmother, a granddaughter, I don't know, the mixed up files, I don't know. So I ask Adele, do you care if I write a, I kind of think I want to write a matchmaker story. And she says, I don't care, go ahead, you know, whatever you want. And I tell my agent about this and she doesn't like the title, my my mixed up files thing, because she said it sounded too, like too much like a children's book. But she's very intrigued by the idea. And then the next day she calls me up and she said, I was thinking about it all night. And I, I want to tell your editor about it because I was, I had a contract for another, for a book and I was working on that book, but she talked to my editor and they said like, I think we will do a two book contract, but we want you to write the matchmaker book first. Cause that mm-hmm. sounds like there's something about it that really everybody wanted that book right then, you know, mm-hmm. because it was just the times we were living in. So I just got to work, but it's, if I say matchmaker to you, you think a romance and I don't write romance. I write historical fiction. So I had to come at it from a historical point of view and all of the, the women's issues and feminism stuff was swirling in my head, which is why I'm so happy that the, your, you know, your reviewer wrote what she wrote about the book because those thoughts really were in my head. You know, the main character is really this young female matchmaker fighting against this wave of established older male matchmakers in the community mm-hmm. so that that was like a big part of the story a big part of the conflict in the story but that's how it came about and of course you dedicated the book to your daughter and her roommate i yeah. love that part because at the yeah. beginning i was like who are these two people who's always read those <laughs> right. beginning I'm like, oh no i know exactly who those two people yeah. are now that's like perfect perfect yeah. And I also have to say, I loved Indian matchmaking. I mean, I absolutely loved that show. It was so fun. It was so fun. There's that one really annoying girl on the show too. And she's <laughs> back in the second season. And I was like, oh, she's never going to get matched. Like she's just not going to happen. But it was just really, it's just fun show to see how the culture works and to see how, but knowing a little bit of that background, watching that show made me think about this show, this book a little bit more as well. Because I was like, oh, this is really interesting how this all happens, you know? So did you always knew, know you were going to have the two timelines? Did you always know that you were going to go in with the story behind? And- yeah. Yeah. So, well, the first decision that I had to really make was what timelines was I thinking of? Mm-hmm. Like, I thought, you know what? I, I want it to be two timelines because I want to have a modern story also. I thought that, I don't know, that I... I I didn't, what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to do the thing that so many people do with, you know, there's, there's a trope that people use a lot of the time with the letter or the piece of jewelry or whatever it is. And you're in a modern timeline and they, you know, the person finds the letter or the jewelry or, and then it's just little flashbacks, but I wanted a real story about Sarah. So it's very equal. It's, there are two Mm -hmm. real true defined arcs of two characters in this story but I really the first decision was that was what time period am I looking at and for a while I thought well I'll, maybe the grandmother will be in the 50s because everybody loves the 50s it's so fun you know but you know what then I started when I once I started doing my research I found this piece on the museum at Eldridge Street website called love on the Lower East Side and it referenced this wedding from 1909 in New York City the 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 daughter of a a Romanian immigrant and they called him the pickle millionaire because he had a big pickle business in New York and his daughter got married and there were 2000 people invited to the wedding. It was like all like this huge New York Times article about an immigrant kid's wedding. It was so strange. And there was this line in that article that said, the scent of orange blossoms and roses mingled with the odors of dried herring and pickles. And when you hear that line, I mean, I said, well, that's it. I have to write about this time period and I'm gonna have a pickle king in my book too, because this is like the greatest imagery that I could ever come up with. And so, and then I read, I learned more. That article used the Yiddish word for matchmaker, Shad Khan, which I had never, I hadn't heard that word. Um, I know a little bit of Yiddish, but not very much. And I knew the word shidduch, which means a match in Yiddish, but Shad Khan is a matchmaker. And I kind of was like, let me just like see, like, why is the New York Times using a Yiddish word? And did they ever use it again? And so I like looked, and then I found this other article, this amazing article that was from 1910 that said at that time in New York City, there were over 5,000 professional matchmakers, Mm. 5,000. And the bulk of them were men. And they 
People wanted to deal with men because it was a business. The men were making their living. It was a business arrangement marriage. And that was why it was men. And so when I read that also, then that whole, you know, I didn't want to write a book about Yenta from Fiddler on the Roof. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to figure out what was real, what the rich cultural, I knew there had to be something. And when I found that out, then the conflict just crystallized you know, mm-hmm. in my head, this is going to be this young woman, and she is going to be making love matches, which is a very modern idea. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the arranged match is an old world, you know, idea that's been around for centuries, the the match made out of convenience made because the families do well together for money for prestige for whatever it is, the love match is a whole different thing. That's mm-hmm. a modern idea. And so it was going to be, you know, the themes come together. It's modernity versus old world. It's a young woman fighting against this whole cabal of men. And so it all kind of came together. And then I knew my time periods because, you know, once, you know, the grandmother's time period, the granddaughter's follows, you know, you, she can only be so old. And I was a young lawyer. I'm pretty much the same age as Abby. I was a young lawyer. I graduated from law school in 1993. So in 1994, I was a very young lawyer working at a big law firm in New York City. And I worked on a, I wasn't a divorce lawyer. I was a trust and estates lawyer. So I worked on a couple of prenuptial agreements because a lot of times in a big firm, they will, a prenuptial agreement can go hand in hand with estate planning. So I worked on some prenuptial agreements and and one really crazy one that that inspired some of the stuff in the story. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. see past does come back. Your past does come back yeah, to haunt you. Yeah, you can't escape it. Yeah. Did you write one timeline first or did you write them, you know, at the same time? No, I always write my books in the order that you read it. Mm-hmm. I can't one of the compliments that I've gotten on this book that makes me so happy is that people say they like both timelines equally because mm-hmm. a lot of times people really are invested in one and not the other mm-hmm. and that they again I didn't want to do that tropey thing where it's like you, you just flash back for no reason I wanted them to be really interconnected really layered together and I couldn't do that if I wrote one and then the other I had mm-hmm. to I would think of an idea and it would, you know, to make it flow, to make it really mesh together. I had to write them in the order that you read it. Was one easier for you though, the historical or the modern, or were they both the same amount of work, same amount of, because 94 is still, while you were that age, it's still some research back of what could you do then? What couldn't you do then? Things like that. No, sure. Um, Yeah, well, 1994 sadly is historical fiction for us, sadly (laughs) for us, but what are we gonna do? Um, I would say, so I was very worried about writing the Abby story because it's the most modern story, even though it's 1994, it's the most modern timeline that I've written. Mm -hmm. And I, writing historical fiction is my sweet spot because there's something about writing about that more distant past. The language is richer. There's something about it that I feel it's just really easy. Not easy, because it's never easy. It's hard and it's a heartache, but... (laughs) But it's it, there's something about it that I feel comfortable sitting in that space. The modern, I feel like, am I funny enough? Can I make it kind of witty enough? Can I make it sparkle the same way? Can I give it the emotional depth that I want it to have if it's not in this foggy past? Can mm-hmm. I do that with it? So that was more of a challenge for me. It was harder. Um, but once I got about halfway through, then I felt comfortable in it. You know, then I was like, you know what, I can do this. And it really, I'm grateful for it because it opened up my, it just opened me up to feeling like I could write. I don't have to always write so far back. Mm-hmm. You know, I can, I can write different times, different, different people. So that, that made me feel good. And sometimes there you're more caught up and everyone's going to know the words. Everybody's going to know the colloquialisms. Whereas before you can kind of fake it. Because yeah. who's going to be around yeah. that really knows, oh, when she was born in 1910, knows exactly what was going on. Here, yeah. it's like, well, wait a second, I can call you out on that. Be yeah. it a piece of um, technology that's available or something that's available. It's a completely different thing. But it's far enough back that it can't be this immediate thing that we can all do all day long now. You know, right. it's right. like, let's just, yeah. It was fun. I I sort of like got into the whole supermodel thing because that was something that was happening back then. And then, of course, like the Charles and Diana divorce happened yes. in 1994. So that, you know, with as the divorce 
kind of thread was that was a really interesting thing. I was just lucky that like, you know, like, well, I mean, I did make it happen that then, you know, I could have picked 1995, whatever, but I wanted that divorce to be in there. Um, Cause that, I thought if you were a young divorce attorney, that was going to be really interesting. Yeah. So I also there love were- the little homage to Christy Turlington. I yeah. love these little things. <laughs> I worked in magazines before when you drop a model's name in, I've got it. You know, I'm like, I'm there. I'm totally yeah. there. And then you found that you wove in these journals that Sarah found that her grandmother had done. And was this um, adding this inspired by anything in particular, or was a good way to ground the storytelling that you had some reference point to go back to as well? So remember I talked about those file cabinets that I read about. So at first I thought I was going to have file cabinets. Um, And then file cabinets just seemed kind of a little too modern and not quite right once I decided on the time period and journals worked better. It just, I wanted there to be some written records that were not, you know, they're not, it's not a diary that, mm-hmm. that, that Abby inherits. You know, she wants it to be a diary. She wants it to be something that's really personal, but it's not, it's like a catalog. It's like, you know, these very mercenary kind of like pictures of people. Um, and, but then there are fun little things slipped in. There's a ticket stub. There's, you know, there's a little note on it that she that she sees. And so those are the things. And I think I wanted it to be like that also because it's the facts. And Abby doesn't believe really her grandmother's stories. She believes that her grandmother was a matchmaker. Mm-hmm. She believes that she met different people, but she thinks a lot of it's really embellished. And she doesn't think that a lot of these fantastical bits and pieces that she tells her when she's young happen. And then when she, when it's the facts, it, it makes it real for her in this, this really special way, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's why I kind of wanted to have that. Yeah, I could see the pencil drawing, penciled writing, crossing things out. I could feel that it wasn't something that was perfect. It was something with notes. Yeah. And from that, she was gonna extrapolate what she thought the stories might be. Yeah. So. What did you learn? Because matchmaking is so interesting that people aren't just looking for love. They're looking for a good match. And the match is usually financial. And and that's the reason I thought men were involved because men were making deals with men. Men were not going to make deals with women. Is that true that what you like, she was really going against the grain if she was a woman trying to make these, these matches? So, I mean, there definitely were female matchmakers then, but as you know, I found out from research, there really were mostly men at that time. Today, there are there are professional matchmakers today. Today, I would say, you know, the bulk of them seem to be women from at least from the websites, you know, the, the Jewish dating websites and things and there are matchmakers. And I've spoke with a modern matchmaker also, and it tends to be women. Um, but back, I think back then it was, you know, a full-time profession, right? Like you would feed your family based on making these matches. Today, maybe it is, I don't really know, but it's it seems to be something that women that women do today. But one thing for sure, matchmakers are supposed to be married. They're not supposed to be single. Like that was a big taboo. And that's a taboo today also, because mm-hmm. how are you supposed to lead someone down the path to matrimony if you haven't done it yourself. And mm-hmm. also there's a whole idea in religious Judaism, this whole modesty idea where, mm-hmm. you know, if you're an unmarried woman, you're not, you're, you're not really supposed to be having these kinds of conversations with an unmarried man. And then there would be the idea that like, well, what's to stop you from grabbing that man for yourself, right? Like, you know, or whatever it is, it's just a very immodest thing to do, to be mm-hmm. talking to a man about that or to meet alone with a man. You wouldn't be allowed to do that. So that was just kind of an interesting, I don't know, just some interesting tidbits that that I thought it was important to share. Yeah. The- yeah, because they make the story real because it's yeah. like, wait a second, this is just not something that, you know, I made up. When you're out doing research, is there ever a moment where you go, okay, I could keep going or I could stop here? Or is there always this, I could do more? I could do more. There's always more. There's always more. Once a couple of years ago, before COVID, I I went, I heard um, Colm Tobin talk about research and he said something, it always sticks with me. He said, you research and you research and you research and you like, you know, you have all of the books and all of the facts and then you seep them all and then you have to forget them when you write. Because mm-hmm. if you if you're just trying to slip them all in, it's like you're writing an encyclopedia entry. You, mm-hmm. A lot of it is ne- and a lot of it never makes its way into the book the way that 
readers think it will. Mm -hmm. It's there in your guts. It's there, it seeps in and you pour it out. It's, it's in, you just absorb the essence of it. And that lets you as the writer go back to that time period and write in from that time period and make it feel authentic. But it's not that you have to get all the facts in there all the time. And do you have the books handy though, as you're writing, do you go back and do research or are you pretty much I'm done as I'm going? Um, I do have them handy. I, I need to do a bunch of it beforehand. Some people don't. Um, for this, I really had to, cause I really had to figure out my time period, you know, like this book, it happened in a strange way, you know, like I say, I'm going to write a matchmaker book and they're like, great, we want it. <laughs> like, you know, it's going to be a grandmother, granddaughter matchmaker book. Awesome. Give it to us. I'm like, well, but I don't even know what it is. You know, what is it? I don't know. Um, and so I had to really figure that out. So that I, I, I had to do a bunch of research first. Um, right. But it's still, you know, no research is like the research I had to do for my second book, which was, it was a home front story, but it was a World War II story. Mm -hmm. World War II research to me is the most intense because you cannot get any of that wrong. Mm -hmm. You can't, people will, people are too knowledgeable. They take it too to heart and you have to get it right. So when you're not researching World War II or World War, when you're not researching a war, I feel like it's easier. It's, it's, there's a little more forgiveness. Yeah, there's a little bit more that you can just uh, play around with the facts a little bit. Yeah. Because it's a yeah. different kind of a story. Yeah. Do you know where the book's going to start or does it evolve or you know where it's going to go? Like you sit down and start writing. Do you know exactly where you're headed or you have a little bit of a roadmap? Do you have an outline or? I knew, I always know generally where I'm going. I know how, otherwise, why am I writing the story? Like I need to, I know some people say like, I just sit down and a character comes to me and then I figure out what it's doing. That's not how I am. There's a story that comes to me. There has to be a story. So I knew this was gonna be a story of this woman who was fighting against these men. And I knew that she was gonna have this granddaughter. And I knew that the granddaughter was gonna be a divorce lawyer and that she was gonna have her own fight. And I knew all that. But I still didn't, it's still, I sit and I sit and I sit with my characters and I think about them and I try to make them real and I try to figure out who they are. And that sitting and thinking takes up a lot of my time. And for this book, I knew that I wanted, I knew that I wanted Sarah's first match to be on the boat coming over. So I knew that, but that was almost like a prologue and it was a little, you know, a little scene. But Abby's first chapter took me weeks and weeks and weeks because it's the setup you i feel that this setup is really important mm -hmm. abby's whole setup of why she became the divorce lawyer that she became her whole thing how am i going to explain to the readers how her grandmother factors in all of it you know the setup was a really her first chapter was really tricky mm -hmm. um, and when i was done with it i felt really good and i knew that that it would i knew that it would become something, mm -hmm. you know, I knew that it was going to go somewhere good. So you said it was tricky. Was that weeks to work on that chapter, a month mm -hmm. to work on that chapter? It was weeks. It was weeks. weeks. Yeah, it was weeks. Did you run it by it's the It's a very girls? long chapter. It's right, a really it long chapter and it's, it covers her relationship with her grandmother. It covers her parents' divorce. It covers her, how her parents told her about the divorce. It covers like so many things that, so that then when you're done with that chapter, you can say, okay, now I have it all. Let's go. Did so the girls was, see it anywhere uh, along the way? Or did they sorry? see anything? Did the girls see any of what you were writing along the way? Oh, no, no. I mean, okay. Adele helped me with the some of the Yiddish. Like I would say, the book doesn't, there are a lot of Yiddish phrases that I found that are sort of sayings that I love. And, I, and when I first wrote it, it had a lot of actual Yiddish and then I would give the English translation. And then one of my friends read it and was like, you know what, Linda, it's like too much Yiddish. Like just, you just need the English, like it's too much. And so in the beginning I had kind of a lot more Yiddish and Adele is fluent in Yiddish. So Adele, like, so she, like, I would say, how do you say, like, I would just want to throw in a word. So I was constantly like, how do you say this word? You know, how do you do? And she would say, well, what's the context and whatever. But, um, but they both read it before, they both read it before it was out. You know, they both read it like when it was a PDF on my computer. You know? I love it. So, I love it. And actually my daughter came and surprised me 
at my book launch. She lives in Washington, DC, but she came and surprised me and I cried. She showed up at the at the Chappaqua Library and I cried. And Adele wanted to come, but Adele's a P Adele's getting her PhD. So she's all the way up in Ithaca. She's at Cornell, so she couldn't get here. Adele, oh, that yeah. would have been so cool though. Yeah. Just let them walk in. So what's editing like for you? Do you, you self-edit? clean up everything before it goes, does it go to your agent first? Does it go to your editor? Does it go to both at the same time? What do you do? I don't, I mean, well, let's see. I really edit myself to death. Like mm -hmm. I am the, that person who writes a sentence and deletes it and writes it and deletes it. So, and then, well, with this book, I sent it when I had like a hundred pages, I sent it I sent it to my agent and my editor. I might have sent it to my agent like a week before, you know, or maybe I sent it at the same, I don't even remember. I think I sent it to my agent first and I really wanted my editor to see it to make sure that she was happy with what it was because she didn't really even know what it would be, you know? So that was really important. And she was happy and we had a really good conversation about um, expanding the matchmaking gift a little bit because it it does sort of change for Sarah a little bit as she gets older and she realizes that not only does she have a gift for seeing people's soulmates she can also see sort of a dark side when something in a in a match is going very very wrong mm -hmm. and that was my editor's mm -hmm. idea um which I really liked and then because she had that idea I thought you know, I want Sarah's gift to change in other ways too. I want her not to just match the same kinds of people that she's known as a child. I want her to match, to expand her world mm -hmm. as her, you know, to expand her matches as her world expands to see this, you know, that there aren't barriers to love in any way. And that, so that's something that I'm really proud of. And that really was a direct result of, of my editor really making me stop and think about, other gifts that Sarah could have. Mm -hmm. You know, I often think that when you're writing a book, not everything makes it. And does something come out that actually could be a short story? And I've thought about this for a long time. And is that short story what you get when you pre-order the book? Is that short story something that, because everybody could probably bang out a short story with a character that dropped out or something like that. And I've had this idea for a really long time, instead of like, we'll just pre-order, pre-order and get something. because. Yeah. I'm always because recently we want people to go to events and buy a ticket, even if it's virtual, so that right. we have that happening. But then anybody who pre-ordered, where's the pre-order event? Like, yeah. I want to know what happens for the people who pre-order the book. And I've always said it should be the event the night before that's virtual, and they can go to their signings if they want. But I'm very big on, we ask everybody to pre-order, what did they get? So my idea is always like, oh, what's that little story? you? I think, that's great. I think that's a great idea. And actually, so I had a book. Um, before the matchmaker book that I wrote that my agent was trying to sell at the very beginning of the pandemic and it wasn't selling and I love it so much and I do have to go and rewrite it. Um, but then uh, Georgia Clark and Hannah Orenstein who started this heartbeat, these short stories by heartbeat asked mm -hmm. me to write a short story for them and I did exactly what you're saying. I pulled a character from that novel mm -hmm. and wrote a short story. Um, and it was so fun because I wanted, and it made me feel so happy because now that character is out there for people to enjoy, you know, and that character is there. And, you know, I feel like I will go back and work on that book again. And, um, but that's, you know, that's what I did. I just had this character and she's like a sculptor, but she ends up working in the North end, you know, like making marzipan, you know, sculpting with the marzipan. Right. And, it's called the sculptor and the marzipan maker, you know, and, and this man sees who she is. He sees that, that she's really an artist, even though she's like stuck in this bakery making marzipan. Um, and she's a terrible baker. She like burns everything. So <laughs> it's a good thing that she could do that because otherwise she'd be fired. She's you decorating. Know? She's but, decorating. But, That's it. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it's a fun, you know, I love that idea that you have because I think so many people, there are things left on the cutting room floor mm -hmm. that we can mm -hmm. use. And, you know, it's, it's a beautiful idea. I think Ellen Hildebrand's, <laughs> yeah, um, Ellen Hildebrand's October book is eight stories and they all come from other books that she's written. And it's all like a character doing something else, a character doing this. And I just think it's for those who 
are big fans of the authors. It's this other little look inside the world. It could be the one that ended up on the floor or the one you had afterwards when you turned everything in and didn't fit. So I don't know. I'm always looking for what is the different marketing way to do? What is something different we could be doing? Because it's, you know, a lot of times- fantastic. It's a lot of times like we sit in an event and everybody goes, oh, how many books did you sell? And you're in a store and that's only you can buy a physical book. But what about all the people who sat there and bought audio? Or what about all the people who sat there and bought an ebook? Because that's the way they read. But instead, we stick everything into this construct that it's got to be like this. And that's not always what the construct is. That's not always what people are doing. So I don't know. That was, I'm I'm tossing that out. So you were a lawyer. (laughs) (laughs) You were a lawyer. What made you decide to leave the law? Oh, I didn't like it. There's so many writers who used to be lawyers. I mean, they, I know. You have a whole well, group. You know, yeah. Well, it's because when, so I graduated from college in 1990 and I was an English major and all the English majors and we all went to law school. What, what else were we going to do? I mean, I feel, I do think like I'm, I don't know why, but I was a really unsophisticated college student. I don't know why I didn't understand or know that there was like a publishing world that I could have tried to get a job in that. Um, I wasn't at a point where I think I would have thought anyone would buy my actual writing, but I, I I wish I had known, I I wish I had educated myself about that and I had done that, but, but a lot of people didn't. And there were a lot of people, a lot of us went to law school. Mm -hmm. And so I went to law school. I hated every second of it. I used to like read my Norton anthology of poetry when I was supposed to be reading constitutional law. I literally (laughs) hated every minute. And then when I was a summer associate for my first job, I had a summer associate job at a very big firm. They had a big trust and estates department and we rotated through departments. And so my first rotation was trust and estates. I go and I sit down and the man who gives me my very first assignment as like a professional lawyer is like right out of central casting. It's like six foot four with the suspenders and the bow tie. And he tells me this story about a Greek shipping magnate who is our client who has a wife in an institution in Switzerland, like a psychiatric hospital or something in Switzerland. And he has many illegitimate children in different countries. So my legal assignment is research the intestacy laws of all these different countries. But I'm just sitting back like, this is a great story. Like, (laughs) this is a story. Okay, I could do this because I could, these are great stories. And that's when I should have known, I should not be a lawyer, I should be, (laughs) I wanted to, I cared about the stories, yeah. you know, that's what always interested me. Yeah. So, you know, I, I got through 10 years of practicing, but I couldn't get through any more than that. So yeah. I was in 17 years of magazines, but always read books. So mm-hmm. it was, yeah. And yep. I, when I started in publishing, believe me, I knew nothing about publishing, nothing. First book expo I went to in 1996. Basically, I was trying to explain the internet to people. Picture that in 1996, okay? <laughs> We're going to be starting this site on the internet. It's a new thing. Like really the internet is what you're going to be doing. Yeah. That that wasn't going so well. So I, um, yeah, so really it was learning the whole publishing business. But the one thing that I do like you, I didn't come from publishing. So Mm -hmm. as a result, the questions are asked are not because I've actually done things a certain way. I'm Mm -hmm. just asking them because this is what I'm seeing as a reader. And I always approach everything as a reader instead of approaching it as somebody in the business. And it's a very different way of looking at it instead of just against a P&L or just against we need to buy this, we should buy this. I'm sort of just looking about like, well, what about this? What about these people? How do you do that? So say I stay outside the business and I'm glad I did, even though I attend lots of things to learn how P&Ls are put together and paper and all this kind of stuff that I actually know zero about, but I find very, very interesting because- Mm -hmm all of that will change how the book ships and all these things. So I did really love that Sarah noting about Prince Charles and uh, Princess Diana. (laughs) I really, really, that was like this really, really moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that was a, that was a big, their wedding was such a big deal. I have the wedding in the book too. You know, the, 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 um, the wedding is in the story. And I remember getting up really early in the morning and watching that wedding with my mother, you know, and, I remember when they were getting divorced, you know, all those things were like touchstones of my own childhood and young adulthood. And I loved putting them in the story, you know, Mm -hmm. they, and then that's also like when I talk about writing it in a linear way, writing it in the order that you read it, when I write that, then I can say, okay, 
well, she's going to get up early in the morning with her grandmother to watch this wedding. And then I bring up the pickle king because, you know, it's the wedding of royalty, right? And then the royalty, then I can go back and talk about the pickle king and intertwine them. The same with like the Kanish war, right? I find out there's a Kanish war um, in 1916. And it to me, when I read about it, warring families, I think Romeo and Juliet. So I think, okay, well, there has to be a match where she matches the daughter of one Kanish shop to the son of another Kanish shop. But then in my next chapter, I'm thinking, how am I going to connect this? And then I loved going to Shakespeare in the park when I was that age and young and living in the city. And that's, you know, I think my law firm, I think I want the, I first went to Shakespeare in the park with my law firm, like as a summer associate, that's what I did. They took us all like as one of the, you know, marketing things for the young people at the firm. And so then I can bring that in. And that way it feels like it's flowing. It feels mm -hmm. like everything is meant to happen the way that it happens, instead of just feeling like you're trying to just like smush two things together that don't go together. Mm -hmm. so. I was thinking about the pickle king. I was thinking about it's a little bit earlier than um, that whole Gilded Age timing, but I was just thinking of the Pickle King having a bigger wedding than the people of the Gilded Age and how they would just make them crazy. They have 2,000 people, they have to have 4,000 people. This is what yeah. we have to do now. It's like really, really fun seeing that, you know? I also, um, there was a lot of Yiddish in the book and I confess to knowing no words, no words, yeah. Roman Catholic here, but I caught on what we were trying to say. And that's pretty cool because I can't say that I would be able to quote the words, but right. by the same token, I knew exactly what you we were doing there. So, you know, hats off. Good you. Well, thank you. <laughs> but I was also, the section about the rabbinical court was so interesting to me because I hadn't thought about that. I had thought about a woman going before that. Um, I knew there were a lot of traditions where it was men oriented, men like, you know, are in charge and things like that. But that whole scene was very real. It was how rigid things were. And she was op operating outside of rigidity. So I feel like we took the story into this is the way it's got to go. Yeah. And then we've got to soften it back down again. Yeah, that was a really difficult scene to write because there were so many voices. You know, there's a lot of it's all dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are these rabbinical courts. It's called a bet in and they exist today still. You know, they, they've been around forever. Um, and it's, it was always supposed to be three three rabbis, but it could be three learned men. That was who were supposed to be, you know, the ones running the court. Um, and so I actually, I talked to, there's very little written about how, what a bet din, what a rabbinical court would have looked like at that time period in the 1920s. So I called up the people at bet din of America today because, um, and spoke to like, they sent, you know, I kind of went around from person to person and I ended up talking to this guy, um, Dr. Zev Elef, who's the president of Gratz College. And he told me, you know, like it was a very unstructured thing back then. It would have, they don't really know a lot about it, but they think it was a pretty unstructured thing. It would have been three men who would decide three rabbis. And so I had a lot of leeway for how that would go. You know, it's not, it's basically the court of public opinion, right? Like it's not binding in terms of our US court system at all, but it's still very legal in the way that it feels. Mm -hmm. And it's still, you know, decisions are made in a very um, thoughtful kind of way. And, but writing that scene was a lot of fun. I mean, usually the rabbinical court, it's in a small room. It's just a few people, you know, it's not like there's a whole big courtroom. It's With not, there's, there's, jur there's no jury, but in my story, all the other matchmaking men in the neighborhood come. So she's just alone and she's in this room and her father, you know, she doesn't have anybody there with her. She doesn't have her father or or any kind of representative. She's just, you know, defending herself. Um, and then at the end, she gets some help from all of the the women in her community who sort of march in um, at the end. And it was just, I was really, I'm really proud of that scene. Like mm -hmm. that's my, you know, that's my, you can't handle the truth scene. <laughs> like, you know. I'm yeah. giving you the truth, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I also did like that everybody wanted to be a warrior because of things that they'd watched on um, movies and yeah. everyone wanted to be a warrior in certain years. Yeah. And you were, you were the firm, you were going to be a tax lawyer. And if you were yeah. watching this one, you were going to be this kind of lawyer. It was very yeah. funny. And it was very, yeah. very true. It's like, yeah. oh, this is what I'll be if I'm an English major going to law school. Right. I'll yeah. try this. Yeah. I'll try this. Yeah. You also have this really funny reference to Lucky Charms cereal. And I feel like there's a little <laughs> Easter egg in there. Now, okay. Is this your go-to cereal or are you referencing somebody in your family or Carol, like don't get that in depth. No, my mom loved sugar cereals. 
My mom loved sugar cereals. She would always be like, she thought that was like the perfect, she wouldn't eat it for breakfast. That was like the perfect like snack while she was watching Dallas. You know, like when she was watching <laughs> Dallas or Dynasty, she would be eating like Lucky Charms or like the Cocoa Krispies or something. She liked those, yeah. But dry, well, like she would take the box and like have it dry. Well, it was like popcorn, you know, she would eat the Lucky Charms while she was watching Dallas. Yeah. That's like so perfect. <laughs> so perfect. So perfect. So do you talk to book groups? Is that something that you're up for yeah, doing? Yeah, I love to talk to book groups. I'll Zoom with, you know, now with Zoom, it makes it so easy. So yeah, I love book clubs. Um, all my books are really book clubby books. You know, they're, they're, there's a lot to unpack and a lot of things I think that are fun to discuss in a group. Um, so I'm definitely open to that. So people can email me, people can find, you know, send me a message on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. I'm happy to try to Zoom with book clubs for sure. And I'm going to add the line that I always add, please tell her what time zone you're in because yeah. she needs to know that to set up the meeting. You know yeah, I've I mean? had some, I've had some very sad, like, misses with book clubs because of time zone issues yeah but i do think that the zoom thing is better there's um it used to be on skype or like a speaker phone yeah. and adrian trujano tells the story one time that they all were drinking wine in the group and they went to the pool and she was still on the phone oh god and they went out to the pool and she's like hello coming back anytime oh soon That's <laughs> you so can't fun. leave on zoom there's the difference oh yeah i did i mean with my first book i went to a lot of book clubs in right. person but um I do like that, but it can be hard. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it can be a little bit hard because people, you know, when people have book clubs, they really, they like to just talk and gossip and eat. Like, you know, it's a very social thing. So it's a little bit awkward when you're the author and you're just like, you don't know who they're gossiping about and you're just kind of waiting to start. And then a lot of my author friends were like, no, no, Linda, you have to like tell them you're coming like after they're all settled. Right. You know, like, right. don't be the first one there. Like, I'm right. so anal about time like I never want to be late notes Linda you can't be the first one there tell them you'll come like a half hour after you know right. like, they have to be ready to talk about the book they have to be yeah. ready to talk about it you know yeah it's, yeah I, I would definitely say that definitely say that did you have the title right away did you know right away what the title was gonna so, be so no so well it's interesting because you know the editor um my editor and my agent wanted me to start working on the book and my editor said they liked the title of the matchmakers library that was the first title which felt a little weird to me because but i was like okay well i can make the i guess i can sort of call the journals like a library like a personal library but after i wrote it then they were like oh no it's going to be called the matchmakers gift which is such a better time you know it fits yeah. in. i love i love that whole i love that title. I really love it. Matchmaker's Library as a title. I could see why they wanted that as a title, but I love Matchmaker's Gift much more. Yeah, I think it's a stronger title. Yeah. And I love the cover because the cover is one of those things that you could just sit and look at for a while and say, where's this piece from and where's this piece yeah. from? It's yeah. really gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. The cover Ooh. was really, they, the they were so, yeah, it's so pretty. They were great um, with taking my input for the cover because I wanted it to look like a ketubah. So, um, which is a Jewish marriage contract, like oh, okay. ketubas are, like mine is framed. I should have brought it with me, but um, they're very decorated and they're often like very floral and they look, they have little symbols on it, like a house and, you know, like to represent your marital home. And so this cover, you know, it has the spectacles cause we have an eyeglass salesperson mm -hmm. and it has the pickle jar, which is my very favorite thing. I, I said, like, please, please, please put some pickles on the cover. <laughs> And when they did, I was like so happy. When they sent me this, the first mock-up of the cover, I was just like beside myself because it had the pickles. Yeah. That was like, honestly, the only thing I saw at first was the pickles. I was just- <laughs> I love it. The pickles. I saw the moon first. I think I saw yeah, the moon first. Yeah, first thing. yeah. And I the wedding the rings, the bracelet. There's a bracelet that figures in there. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 So and then the, just like the whole, the whole swish of stars across the front is just, you get that- kind of magical sense you know you you know something slightly magical is going to happen there so yeah. i love that no it's terrific it's absolutely terrific it's your color too carol it's my color <laughs> I, know, I, I, perfect, I wore something to kind of compliment today yes i never yeah. like to like you know sometimes i match yeah. the book but i, I know you're more turquoise you're a little more, more blue you're a little more turquoise this is a little more teal but it's a good yeah color. i was looking in the closet today literally i go in and sometimes <laughs> i don't get rid of clothes that i don't even like because i said i might need red again like just yeah. hold it you know <laughs> Just hold it for going on screen. Nothing more, nothing more. 
So um, the audio, something interesting. You've got Eva Kaminsky and Gabra Zachman are the narrators. Uh, did they each do a different time like period? Is that what they did? Yeah, one is Sarah and one is Abby. Yeah. Yeah. At first they were just going to do one. And I said, can we please have two different voices? I would really love to have two different voices. I, I thought they might get a much older narrator, mm -hmm. to do Sarah. Um, but neither one of them is very old, you know, they're they're young. But um, but I like the idea of two two separate voices. All right. Well, a number of readers who have listened to me when dual timelines have told this to me. When they listen on audio, they're often lost because it's the same voice. And I actually wrote somebody in marketing at Macmillan today to say, is that something that they're doing too, is the two voices so that you can keep the timeline separate? Because yeah. it's really difficult for the reader if you're listening to know where you are, because you haven't, you've turned to a new chapter, but it's not kind of the same break as what you did in the book. And you can paginate back easier in the book than you could do on audio. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I have that question out, like as my non-publishing person question of the day, you know? I, lo I love the idea of the two, two separate voices. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to listen yet? I've listened only to like samples in a little bit, but I haven't, you know, like right now, I feel like if I listen, I, I, I mean, I'm a little bit sick of myself, you know, like you start promoting your book and you just like, I'm so sick of myself. Like, I, you know, who wants to listen to me anymore? So like, I listen to, I do listen to a lot of other audiobooks. Um, I, that's become a big thing for me since COVID. Like mm -hmm. I listen when I'm walking my dog. I actually listen now, like sometimes I, put it on, like, you know, you can set a sleep timer. So if I'm really, if I am up in the middle of the night and I can't fall back asleep, I'll put it on and then just listen and like put it on a half hour sleep timer and just like, and then I listen to, then I won't listen to one. I'll listen to like, like an old classic. You know okay. what I mean? Is that, that will put me to sleep. Like I'll listen to <laughs> Oliver Twist. No, I'll listen. You know what I mean? Like my, my friend's books <laughs> will put me to sleep. No, Oliver no. Twist will put me to sleep. Oliver Twist, you know, I like something like that. It's nice though. Like, nice. I don't know. I like it. Yeah, totally, totally, totally good. Yeah. Um, are you thinking about or working on? Okay, you had the book you started on. You have the other yeah. thing. Where are you now? Which one are you working on? So, okay. So I put aside the book that I was working on because once I wrote, this book was a real, de it's not a real departure. It's historical fiction, but it had that little splash of magic. And it's definitely like my most joyful book. Um, it's my absolutely 100% my most joyful book. So after I did that, and even seeing the early reaction to it, it I wanted to do that again. Um, so I'm doing that again, you know, mm -hmm. because it just feels good, you know, and, and people like it. And I don't know, it just feels good. So my next book is inspired by my husband's great grandmother, who graduated from pharmacy school in 1921. Wow, he's a really interesting person. My my mother-in-law actually has the mortar and pestle that she used that because it was her grandmother. And I've heard all these stories about how she would doctor her certificate so that she could work longer. Like I think she worked until she was like 80 years old and they thought mm -hmm. she was like 60, which is maybe not such a good idea when you're doling out medicine, but I'm not going to get into that. So it's a story, it's about a young female pharmacist, but it is also sort of two timelines. We see her when she's retired and she's 80 and she moves to Florida and she runs into the man, she's never been married. She runs into the man who had been the love of her life. And mm -hmm. then we, um, we go back to her as a young girl and she's like caught, her father's a pharmacist. So she's caught between like her father's very rigid sense of like, is faith in just medicines and exactly the dosage that exactly you're supposed to do. And then this other woman's like her relatives sort of like old world cockamamie things that she's like making in the kitchen, you know? And then there's, there's chicken soup, might be magical, might not be. There's, you know, Jewish penicillin. It's like, you know. Totally there. It's yeah, totally there's love potion that goes very wrong. You know, there's like some things. It's also, it's not really, it, it's the same amount of magic as the matchmaker's gift, just like a little touch of it. Like, and you're, is it really magic? Is it just circumstance? What is it? You know, so there's a little bit of that, but it's, it has some fun, it has some really fun parts. I love writing this, this 80 year old, it's super fun. And I love writing the pharmacy in Brooklyn, you know, like it's a fun thing. A pharmacy is a fantastic setting because, mm -hmm. you know, the pharmacists are like, 
they're like your priest and your therapist yes. and your bartender. Like they're, everybody tells them their secrets. It's a great thing, you know, for a book. We have one in town, Edgewood Pharmacy, and Steve has a line, like the pharmacist and people yes. go, Steve, now I've got this question. And it's like, you're going to confession when yes, you go over to Steve. 100%. So, okay, so I'm doing this drug and I don't know if this one, like, no, what do you think? Or you bring over a bottle, like, is this the one? And he goes, no, that's the one. And it, it's just really, yeah. really funny. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it is. It's a whole thing of going yeah. to the store like that. Yeah. So. yeah. so it's a fun, it's a fun thing to write about. It's a fun setting. Fun setting. Well, before we go, I, for those who are watching on video, you're sitting in front of a sign with words on it. Now, <laughs> where your head is, I can see some. So I feel like I'm Vanna yeah. White. Like, can I buy another what vowel? It? Okay, you so move this at time. one point. Okay. And I think I get what it is. So okay. let me see. This time, you, know, you want to guess? Let me try. Let me just try. Okay. I'll pay extra for a happy ending. Yes. Did you move enough for me to see it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. It's kind of naughty. Like, okay, it's kind of naughty. So I try, like, depending on my audience, sometimes if I'm doing a book club, I don't do it in front of it. But the thing is, I saw this and I really wanted to get it for my office, which is, this is the room over my garage. And my husband was like, you know what that means, right? And I said, I didn't. And, I, and then he told me, and I said, but I'm. A, it doesn't mean that if you're a writer, it means something different to me. So it's not naughty for me to have it. I'm allowed to have it. And it means exactly what it says. That's it. That's it. It's the end, the end. That's what it is, but not that end, this yeah. end, you know? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was just so funny because you as you sat down and I was like, okay, what do I think it is? And then you moved at one point and I said, I think I've got the words. So for anybody listening on podcast, you're not quite getting what I'm talking about, but yeah. trust me, it's there. Trust me, yeah. it's there. It's blue and sparkly. It has like silver spark. It looks like it's silver great. balloon letters. Yeah. It's great though. It's yeah. really, really terrific. As always, it was so nice to be able to talk to you. I'm oh, it's so, so like, nice to chat. Oh, we're not in you. person. I think the last time I saw you might have been in Tucson. In Tucson, in yeah. 2019? 19. 19. But I'm going to see you in Morristown. I'll see you in Morristown next week. Next yep, week. Here I'm we excited. Again. I'm going to give you a big again. hug. <laughs> here we go. Big hugs. Big hugs. Everybody's, and then they'll sit there and go, someone had COVID. And I'm just like, right. I don't even want to hear that word at all. I don't want to hear the word mask. I don't want to hear anything. I just want to have a good time. Seriously. We're going to have a good time. It's going to be, it's going to be, be fun. fun. So, be fun. so nice to be with readers, right? Like yes, to be in exactly. a room with readers. That's yes. what we want. Yeah. And your book will be out just long enough that some people have already read it, which will be yeah. really nice as well, as opposed to introducing something brand new and everybody going, okay, in the audience, somebody's going to raise yeah. their hand and go, I know this, I want to talk to you about that. It'll so, be fun. Thank you so much for joining us. I thank really, you. really appreciate your time. Oh, it was a great talk. It was all, it's always great to talk to you, but this was super fun. Super fun. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To. Remember, you can find us on YouTube for any of our past interviews or sign up so that you'll never subscribe, so that you'll never miss anything, or on podcasts, wherever you listen. Thanks for us joining us, everyone. Thank you.